Good evening, my name is Mandy McLaren, education reporter with the Courier Journal, and I'm joined this evening by Jefferson County Public Schools Superintendent Marty Polio. We are in the third floor of the Academy at Shawnee, and tonight we are here to discuss all things magnet schools. And we're having this conversation follow the, following the publication of a reporting project uh, that was published in the Courier, Courier Journal about two weeks ago. If you have not had a chance to read any of those articles yet, you can find them all at courierjournal.com slash magnetic pull. There is also a podcast that accompanies that series called A Bad School, which you can find on Apple Podcasts or wherever you prefer listening to them. So we're gonna just jump into it. Um, the way that this is gonna work this evening, we've already um, asked you readers to submit some questions to us. So I have those on my computer. Um, we also have somebody monitoring the live comments um, on the Facebook live feed. So if you have questions, feel free to drop them in there. We will do our best to get to as many as we can. So thank you for being here. Thank you, Mandy. Enjoy being here and discussing this important topic with you. Great. So I think I'm curious just to start from the reporting that I wrote and was published in the Courier Journal what have been sort of your biggest takeaways? Well, I think, um, you know, you have stated many of the things probably much more eloquently than I have in your uh, series and, and much more in depth. Um, but I think they are things we have been wrestling with, the concepts that you have talked about in there and shared with the community, which I think is important for the community to see this and no, so I would obviously encourage those who have not read it uh, to, to take the opportunity to, to read the series of articles because I think it's critically important. Um, but, you know, really um, the things that, that we have talked about now in committees, Magnet Schools of America recommendations, which you reference in there, the process of us going through a student assignment committee, these are many of the things that we've discussed along the way. So I, I think it's, uh, I felt very important um, for you to really um, show the whole community some of these inequities that are occurring in our magnets. Um, and I think it, it amplifies the need for us to move on it. You know, unfortunately, as we were getting prepared to move on these, as you know, 18 months ago, the pandemic hit and it's kind of slowed that process. But Today, with the announcement of vaccines, five to 11 year olds, I think it's a perfect time to begin talking about this. I won't say it's the end of the pandemic, mm -hmm. but having all of our students with the ability to be vaccinated within seven or eight days from now, I think it's the perfect time to take a look at your series and say these are the things that must be fixed. So before we dive into this any further, I think it's probably important for us, for those that are coming to us, maybe haven't, who haven't read the series yet, um, just to make sure everybody's on the same page about what a magnet school or program is here um, and also the history of magnet programs. And so I know you already know this. If you want to sort of explain a little bit of where magnet schools and programs sort of originated and how you see that original intent um, compared to what plays out here in Jefferson County. Yeah, sure. So I think it's first of all important that we understand historically what happened with student assignment here in Jefferson County Public Schools. That has happened in many cities across America and most major urban areas are struggling in some way with how you assign students and how students are assigned to magnets to ensure equity and all students have the same opportunity for seats in magnets. So this is not something that is exclusive to JCPS. However, our history is very different than others. So as most know, in 1976, it was court-ordered desegregation, where we had two school districts, Louisville uh, School District and Jefferson County combined into Jefferson County Public Schools. At that time, for eight years, students were bused both ways, east to west, south to, uh, south to west, and then west end out to east and south. And that was an alphabet-based system. It, fast forward eight years later, there was not a lot of political will to continue that. And so what ended up happening was that only predominantly black students in West Louisville were bused out to the suburbs, while white students could, could stay, predominantly white students could stay close to home. 
but the district also added this um, series of magnets, so to speak. So DuPont Manual was created at that time. The traditional schools were created at that time. And they were originally designed, and you can go back and look at the statements from the Board of Education and the leaders. They were originally designed um, as magnets to bring white students into predominantly poor or black communities. And they have accomplished exactly what they have set out to do. So we have to say this has not been something that has just leaked over time or something that has gone away from its original purpose. The magnets, as you report in your series, are accomplishing exactly what they wanted to do, which was to draw white students, predominantly white students, from affluent areas into more predominantly um, high poverty areas. And so, you know, that's what's happened. Now, nationwide, Magnets are meant to be a place to draw diversity so that it is a place where all students in the school have the same passion or interest in the type of education they want to learn. Let's use STEM for example. Every student in the school is passionate about STEM, but kids have equal opportunity from all neighborhoods um, and there are, uh, you ensure diversity both of race and socioeconomics. But our magnets and our student assignment plan still dates back to 1984 um, and is, is accomplishing the task that was set out in 1984. And I think it's important to acknowledge that there are roughly 60 magnet schools and programs in the district and in the series that I wrote and that we'll be sort of discussing about discussing tonight uh, it was mainly focused on those magnets that everybody knows. Mazik manual, male, and of course the series did not get too much into elementary school, but it's the same thing mm -hmm. there, right? With Lincoln and Brandeis and, and Great House. Uh, if you are a Louisvillian hearing this, you know all of those names uh, right away and you know what they signify. Um, one of the questions that somebody was curious about is, what have you been hearing from the community since the series published? I don't think that's a great question. I think, um, you know, I've been hearing um, a lot of Louisvillians understood this, but I don't think understood it to the degree in which you paint the picture in the series. So, um, you know, clearly understand that that was the purpose and this is the purpose of magnets, but I guess they haven't really seen the problem with that. And so I think your series did a very good job of framing what the problem with that is and how certain students aren't getting access to magnets if their families don't have the social capital to navigate the system. Um, so we've known that and I've heard plenty of people say, is, is, isn't that what you, you know, Career Journal did that series, isn't that what you want to change? And I say, yes, this is exactly what we want to change. So this is exactly um, why I've been saying it, and I think it just does a really good job of giving a complete picture of what the reality is, why it's that way, and what problems that causes. And one of the things that the series really focused on was at these elite magnets um, is what you just brought up, access, and who is actually enrolling and being able to benefit not just from, you know, the teachers and the programming and the peer groups, of those programs, but also the trajectory that it sets them on. Um, clearly in the traditional system, if you go from Great House, I believe you then go to Barrett, and then most choose to go to Mail. So if you can get in Great House from the beginning, you're gonna go all the way through and could be simp you could bring out the Brandeis to Mazik to manual MSD example as well. Um, were you surprised by any of the I guess more specific findings, and I want to focus on manual in particular. Um, for example, in the MST program at manual, that's the math, science, and technology magnet, in, I believe, last school year, out of 516 students, only 33 were black. I guess, what did you make of that, and what do you think is leading to that disparity? Well, um, I'm, I'm not necessarily surprised at that because I've looked at the data at DuPont Manual and seen that 13%, you know, black students is, is really where we are at, at, at DuPont Manual High School. So not surprised at that at all. 
Um, I think when we look at whatever, whether our magnets, whether it's DuPont Manual or any of our other magnets, elementary, from Lincoln to Brandeis or any others, or even navigating not a whole school magnet, but a, 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 a magnet within a school, um, for a parent to navigate that process is extremely challenging um, and takes a lot of social capital. And so usually what we tend to find are, you know, on those that, you know, don't have that social capital, maybe working multiple jobs, uh, may not have uh, the knowledge of knowing how to navigate the system, usually will not be able to find their way into one of our magnet programs. And I think you did one of the articles on what it takes to get into manual high school. Uh, so I really think it shines a light on admissions to criteria. Um, and I will say our entire student assignment system, this, this is very important to understand. So the magnet program and our reside specifically here in West Louisville. It is based upon if you are a successful student, historically, you have choice. If you have made mistakes as a student, we have pretty much eliminated your choice. And so, for example, a student in West Louisville right now in middle or high school, if they make a mistake or a struggle in elementary school or early in middle school, they have essentially eliminated their choice to middle school and high school and must go to their resides. And it eliminates the magnet choice. And so I think we have to do a better job when we look at the criteria for entrance we're not punishing kids for mistakes that they make as a 9, 10, 11 year old. Or even worse, we were having, um, we've eliminated this now, criteria to enter, enter elementary school, a four year old. So essentially we are judging entrance into our magnets um, by, by family, social capital, and income. And so I think all of those show exactly in China's spotlight on why you see those numbers at DuPont Manual. And you brought up the, the other option here, right, is the reside school or what some folks would call the neighborhood school or your zone school. Another piece of this project sort of illuminated within this uh, vast world of choice in the district, um, it has created the system of the haves and the have nots and um, the impact that this is having on schools like were featured in the series Iroquois High School, um, which actually back in the 60s was a school that parents clamored to get their kids into. Um, and it was only after busing and it began to integrate and then the district, like you mentioned in the early 80s, st started opening these magnet schools all around Iroquois that its prestige started to go down. And that's that sort of reputation, that prestige is a big thing in this community um, you're a former bad school principal. Could you talk to us a little bit about how that influences where you want to make changes in the system? Yeah, sure. So the schools that, that I've worked in, in JCPS Academy at Shawnee is where I started. Wagner High School was where I spent nine years, teacher, assistant principal. J-Town High School is principal, Doss High School is principal. Depending upon how, who you speak to, and this is all subject to who you speak to, they could all be considered bad schools based upon um, this narrative that we have in Jefferson County, good school and bad school. Um, and I think that narrative um, is extremely harmful to students and staff throughout our community. And, I, and you know, this is a little aside from the student assignment discussion. But we have to say what, and I, I usually challenge people to say, when you say a good school and a bad school, what does that mean? And usually when we get to the underbelly of it all, a good school is one with a collection of high achieving students, usually from high upper middle class to upper class students in a school, parents with a lot of social capital. And a bad school is usually one with high poverty rates, kids that have high, we have high homelessness in the school, uh, high rates of special education, English language learners, and families without that same social capital. And so I think it's, um, you know, extremely disappointing when you hear that's a bad school just because it's a school with high poverty. And instead, I think as a nation, we need to start focusing, what is a good school? A good school is a school that has a collection of a teachers, educators, and adults who every single day 
open their arms and give every, they bring it every day to meet the needs of their kids in their school. When I left DOS after a couple years, I, I would have put that staff up against anyone in the state to say, this is a great school, but it was still called a bad school at that time and it still is today. And so I think that narrative is very damaging. Um, and I think that has led to a lot of the, the, the same problems that we have when it comes to uh, student assignment and that need for families to get into certain schools. So I believe this, you can have a school with high proficiency rates, scores very high. It can be an effective school, it could be an ineffective school. Vice versa, you could have a school with low proficiency rates. It could be effective or it could be ineffective. But it's not one or the other just based on those proficiency rates alone. And I think we really have to start looking at that and seeing it. Um, and I, I think that really uh, puts pressure on the whole student assignment plan for parents to navigate their way to get into these so-called good schools. Um, we've received several questions from parents who either have had that social capital or some that, you know, didn't necessarily have, have it, but they worked as hard as they could to figure it out on their own. And uh, I think the, the questions that they have are, you know, I, I'm making a choice for my child and I shouldn't feel, be made to feel bad about that. And for me, diversity is not, why would that be the priority? It should be more about who deserves to be there. Would you, I'm assuming you've heard from parents mm -hmm. that have that point of view. Um, what is your response? Well, um, you know, I've personally as a parent experienced student assignment in multiple ways. And so, you know, I first of all like to tell my own experience. So I live in the Highlands um, and our reside school going into elementary school when we were putting our daughter in kindergarten was Hawthorne. Everyone in the Highlands said, don't go to Hawthorne, that's a bad school. Which I can't figure out what was the criteria that they were using that makes Hawthorne a bad school. You know, was it the teachers? Was it the kids that go there? Was it the test school? Was it the diversity within the school? The other side of that, people were saying Bloom is the school you should be going to. That's a much better school. Until we walked into, we walked into Bloom and toured it, fantastic school. We loved it, said it was great. But we said, before we try to navigate this system, I was a principal at the time, and I try to make, do anything I can do to get my daughter into Bloom. I said, let's go look at Hawthorne, Spanish immersion program. We went into a third grade classroom and saw kids and the teacher in the math class speaking fluent Spanish. And I said, that's the school for our, and my wife and I said, that's the school for our daughter. And we put her in there and six years later, it's exactly what we wanted. So I understand what, you know, as a parent, I was thinking I've got to get my child into the best school. It just so happened the best school for our child was Hawthorne Elementary, which was the one they are saying is not, not the good school that we had to choose from. So what I would encourage parents to do is to really think and say, take a look at the school. Give that school that opportunity. Just because someone in the neighborhood or the community or on social media says that's a bad school, it may be the best school for your child. And I will look back and say, Hawthorne Elementary was the right choice and we couldn't have gotten a better education for our daughter than going to Hawthorne Elementary. And so, you know, I think it's very important to set aside the narratives that people hear or have heard for many, many years about good school and bad school, and instead explore the options and specifically the programs in a school like we did with Spanish Immersion and say that's, that's a great school for our child. Some of the things that you have talked about even just in this conversation about questioning is this the way that should, we should be doing things, for example, you know, basing criteria even into a middle school on behavior records or standardized test scores, um, or even at the high school level, manual, for example, uh, there's always questions about uh, transparency in the admissions process, and one thing you've proposed before is centralizing that those two things both played out in your own family, correct? With your daughter going to uh, no middle and then on to manual. 
if the things that you're proposing would have made it more difficult to her get in, for her to get into those mm -hmm. schools and her qualifications were still the same, is that still the right thing to do? Because now, and I'm asking this because you've already gone through that, right? Mm -hmm. She's already getting close to graduation, probably too close for your liking. Much uh, too close. But for parents that are still in the system and see these potential changes um, as possibly taking opportunities away from their kids, that when they look at their kids, they see somebody that's worked hard and is deserving. Um, how are how are parents supposed to respond to that? Yeah, so it was that, that was difficult for me. And I, I'll, I'll be honest, the schools I told you I've been at, you know, all my career I have, have, you know, been considered, you know, the inferior school to DuPont Manual. So, I mean, that, that, that's been a challenge for me. And so, first of all, when we chose to go to no middle school, she wasn't in the gifted and talented program. This is what I think the power of magnets are that we have to keep. It's so important. My daughter loved dancing, drama, musical theater, and singing. She wanted to do it at school. When kids find something that they feel a sense of belonging at that school and they raise their hand and go to school for that reason, the research is just undeniable that the likelihood of them being successful is very, very high. So we, she said, I wanna go where I can do musical theater during the school day, which she did and was a part of that program at No Middle School. And once again, we had a fantastic experience. I think the hard thing is the pressure on kids. She was then surrounded by uh, nearly every kid in the school who wanted to go to DuPont Manual and that pressure to apply for that school and be in that school was very palpable among her group of friends. Um, you know, I, I was uh, in a way saying I'd love for her to go to, Man or, excuse me, to Atherton. That's, that is our reside school mm -hmm. and I would have loved for her to go to Atherton because it's a fantastic school. But her draw to uh, musical theater and youth performing arts school you know, it was important for her to continue that journey. And I said, you can apply, you know, I'll help you apply like any other family or parent would do, but it will all be based on whether you are good enough to be in that musical theater program. Uh, but I also understand the pressure on families and, and on kids who want to get into manual, but I also say this, we have a lot of kids who um, may be from families that don't have the social capital that would experience the same love of Y Pass or other programs in manual as well. But my daughter would have been very successful in Atherton or Ballard or any other school we had chosen. So let's talk a little bit about um, what you're proposing to do with the magnet schools and programs. Um, you know, I've I haven't been able to respond to really any of the emails in my inbox, but a lot of them read the series as uh, Marty Polio wants to get rid of all magnet schools. <laughs> um, so let's sort of walk myself and mm -hmm. the listeners through what are, if you could outline, what are the changes that you're proposing? Yeah. So when it comes to magnets is what we're talking about here specifically. Mm -hmm. Is that So when it comes to magnets, um, you know, there, there are a few things. And first of all, I want to say these are not Marty Polio recommendations. These are recommendations that came from Magnet Schools of America nearly a decade ago. They came from an internal committee that worked on it prior to me becoming superintendent. And I got the results when we came superintendent. There, are, there is the recommendations that come out of the, our Magnet application grant that continue to be denied, as you talked about, because of our lack of doing best practices. And so, you know, I really want to emphasize that. These are not things that I think are just, I sat in my office and said, I think we need to do this. These are recommendations uh, based on best practice and national guidelines. But first of all, I believe in magnets. I, I wanna say that, I believe in magnets, and I said that earlier. When a student raises their hand and says, I wanna go to a school for a specific reason, then you know that the likelihood of them being more successful is uh, i mean it skyrockets so whether that's in a reside school and they say i want to go to a reside school because of xyz at that school they're going to likely be more successful and so it gets into our bigger thing of offering more kids choice but when it comes to magnets it is really about making sure that all kids have access and opportunities to these magnets 
So some of it is building more magnets, but we do those where students in the communities have access to some of those seats and we have diversity in those seats as well. Um, so that's number one. But number two is ensuring that we do things like, first of all, we have diversity targets at our magnet schools. And I don't think, you know, you talked about the small percentage of students that are being accepted um, into DuPont Manual. And as, as, a, as a school district, you know, if we value diversity, then that should be for all of our schools. But more than anything, giving every kid a, an opportunity to raise their hand and say, I want to be a part of that magnet. Some of it is more magnets, but others is to make sure that we have um, equal access and opportunities. We have clear criteria. So a, a lot of it is that we are proposing clear transparency. So we want transparency about if a child gets into a magnet, they got in because of X, Y, Z. If they didn't get in, they didn't get in because of the following rubric that we are following. And so having clear criteria, bringing that to the district so there is clear criteria. Most of the magnets having a lottery, so there's equal opportunity for those who qualify. Um, I think a big one that people, you know, that is very controversial is no exits. I mean, I have a, a clear belief from my beliefs about best practice for kids and from what I've experienced as an educator that when a, when a child and a family chooses a school, it's imperative for that school to own that child and make sure they do everything they can for that child to be successful. We know through research and what we've seen in JCPS, when a child is exited from a magnet program, that is devastating for the trajectory or future of that child. And I think it's really critically important that we build the interventions necessary to support successes and not cast them aside to another school. Well, that was one of the questions I think somebody asked, what happens to children who are exited from magnet programs? Well, what happens is, is usually it takes away any choice they have in the future. They go to their reside school. Um, so when I was principal at Jaytown and principal at DOS, um, every year I would have a certain number of kids who would have been exited from a magnet program and sent to us who is a reside. So if they lived in the Jaytown resides, they would come to Jaytown. They lived in the DOS resides, they would come to DOS. But you would have kids that were already struggling who had now been, you know, essentially exited from their school, and then we would take this child in and do everything we could, a good school would do, to intervene, provide supports, catch them up, whatever is needed to provide those academic and behavioral interventions. But there is no doubt it puts a stress on that reside school to meet those needs when they are already meeting the needs of so many kids uh, that are already at that school. So I think it's important that we build in the intervention and supports at the magnet programs as well. Whereas a school, any magnet school really, any of the traditionals or manual, they, they have a pretty consistent student population throughout the year. They may lose some kids, but they do not have to be taking if you lived in Louisville, you understand that it's a very transient district. I think you said before, 250 students changing schools every day. Um, and a lot of that does have to do with poverty. And whereas a school like DOS, you know, if you were a teacher there, your cast of characters in your room, as soon as you get to know them, it can, it can flip on you, right? And that adds to the, the exhaustion, the burnout as a teacher. Um, whereas uh, these magnet schools are really protected from that. They have this privilege. So I think it's important we, we really hit on this because what you just said is so critical and it goes beyond just the magnet conversation. Mm. It goes to the school accountability conversation as well and accountability at that school level that leads to that good school, bad school narrative. There wasn't a day at Doss High School there wasn't a day that I can remember that I didn't walk by the counselor's office and that there were two or three students sitting in the chairs waiting to enroll at Doss High School. Mm -hmm. And so for each of those students, that's seven new classrooms that they were going into. And they may only be there for six, eight, ten weeks before they move again and, an, and, and another student comes in. But each day that is half 250 every single day in JCPS. So when we say let's hold schools accountable and compare a DOS or a J-Town who has unbelievable mobility in and out to a magnet school who has very little, if any, mobility, 
you know, that is completely comparing apples to oranges. And so you as a teacher know this, you're working hard to make sure your kids are proficient in the standards and you work hard. And all of a sudden in mid-year, a new student comes in, you have to assess where they are, you have to find out where they are, you have to find out the needs of this kid to intervene, to begin that process with the kid. So mobility is extremely challenging that our reside schools face and really not to say all of our magnet schools, but predominantly magnet schools do not face. Have you had conversations either with Commissioner Glass at the Kentucky Department of Education or any number of lawmakers who have a say over edu education policy in the state about these things that are beyond your control about how schools are judged and how they are compared apples to apples when in reality they're not. Yeah. Have you had any conversations um, about? Yes, I have. I've become um, much more open, I think, and I do have a perspective that maybe others don't because I was in a, a school like DOS where nearly 85% of the kids qualified for free or reduced lunch. And I'll say this, a good comparison, I believe this, and you could line this up any city in America. You could almost save the testing accountability and we could line up high schools top to bottom by the number of cars in the student parking lot. I think I told you all that before. But if we said how many cars were in the parking lot of a school, high school today, meaning the family has enough money to buy their child a car, it would line up almost from top to bottom the number of cars in the student parking lot. So I think that really reflects um, the challenge that comes with a high poverty or one of those bad schools, so to speak, that is really unfair in the accountability game. I want to say this, I believe in accountability, I believe there has to be accountability, and I believe good things have happened from accountability, like better education for special education students, and identifying, clearly identifying the achievement gap. But there's a lot of negatives that have happened to it as well. Uh, Dr. Glass and I have talked about this significantly. We speak to uh, legislators as much as we can. Um, now when it comes to student assignment and legislators, I have to say this because I think it's very important. We have a lot of charged words that we use in Jefferson County for many, many years. One of those is neighborhood schools. Um, I believe in a community like ours, once again, I'll go back to it. When students have choice, families have choice, and they can raise their hand and say, we want to go to a certain school for a certain reason. It benefits the school, it benefits the child, and it benefits the community. And so providing choice, I think, is imperative for our families and kids as long as all families and all kids have choice. And for 40 years in Jefferson County, what we have had is only a certain group of students who have had choice to go to the school closest to their home or to access a magnet. And so when we talk about the achievement gap, there are so many things that contribute to that. Student assignment is one big one, not the only thing. This is not going to fix everything, but it is one thing we must address as a community. So I say that, but I also fight against the narrative of neighborhood schools. Because when we think about those schools that have, and I'm just going with high schools because it's the smallest <laughs> group that I can speak about, mm -hmm. like a Western, like a Shawnee, a Doss, an Iroquois, you know, it, we, can, we can go back decades at this point and see even in, you know, the Courier Journal, you know, the bottom 10 rankings. Um, these schools haven't shifted, and I think a lot of times when we hear criticism, criticism about the district, and um, many times that's coming from folks who believe one of the solutions could be opening up to private school choice and allowing public funding to go towards private and parochial schools. This is what they're pointing to, right? How over decades and decades, you know, we've heard promises that we are going to change this, but those schools we're not seeing the change that has been promised and you know part of that how much of that I guess you said student assignment is a part of that if student assignment doesn't have a dramatic overhaul and let's say everything else that you you know have issues with including state accountability in the way that's done if student assignment stays exactly the way it is what Will we ever see change with those schools? 
Well, once again, I want to get to, I think, although people don't know this, I think you can go into a school that is that may be considered in the bottom, and I'll go back to, you know, 2017 at DOS. I'd put it up against any school for the work that was taking place. So I don't want to say, you know, that I really don't, I, I, and I'm going to stand by this, that, it, that it's a bad school or it's the fault of the school. When you look at a Shawnee, for example, where we're sitting right now, the student assignment plan in 1984 was developed for Shawnee where kids right around this school could not attend this school. Since that time, the attendance at this school has dramatically declined to around 500 students from a high of probably 12 or 1300 students. But it's doing exactly as it was designed for in 1984. There was no other way that this was going to go if we go back in time getting Doc Brown's DeLorean, you're too young for that. No, actually but, I'm not. <laughs> and go back in time and said this is what's going to, we should be able, this is exactly what would happen to a school like Shawnee because the lack of amount of students who have access to this or choice to this school. And so, you know, I, I think, yes, I, I don't want to say this is all student assignment. We have to do things here in this district. You know, make sure our, our best teachers get to some of our most challenging schools increase our student learning time outside of school. You know, this is the devastating thing for us, Mandy. The, the resides, the, the, the dual, or excuse me, the satellite areas that we are sitting in right now, nearly half of the high school students in this satellite area are chronically absent, meaning 18 or more school days a year. So are there a lot of things that go into absences? Without a doubt. You know, we can get into social, medical, all kinds of things that lead to absences. But can we also say if a student misses the bus and can't get to their school, that when half of our high school kids in this, this satellite area right now miss nearly 18 school days a year, why would we expect a whole lot of different outcomes? So we've got to attack that. We've obviously got to address additional learning time, summer learning, high intensity tutoring. We have to, facilities has to be a major part of this. How we do school, the instruction we provide, how we resource our high poverty schools, all of these things are a part of that. But I'm, I, I want to be clear to, to your question. I do not believe substantial um, change and improvement that lasts over time can be made without changes to our student assignment plan. Um, I'm going to come back to that. First, I'm going to sort of switch into a little bit of a rapid-fire question mode. These are not necessarily rapid-fire questions, but I want to make sure that we get to as many as we can um, before our hour is up. Um, I think there was a little bit confusion about how lotteries work, um, and so the lotteries are at all of the elementary magnet schools as well as any traditional school. Um, could you explain to lis the listeners how did the, how did the lotteries work and specifically in regards to diversity at the yeah. school. So, you know, we have three categories of diversity in JCPS, the one, the two, and the three based upon highest need, and um, we could get into how they are done, but that was changed when the Supreme Court says you could not assign students solely based on race. And so we had three, and essentially when a student applies, um, a lottery just like any other lottery picks an order, but in the three categories, one, two, and three. And so when we're talking about magnet schools, um, you know, and not, that is not a DuPont manual, but most of our magnets, or excuse me, our, our uh, traditional schools, the, you know, the sequence is to choose a student from one, two, and three. So you have a balance of need, race, um, educational attainment in that area, socioeconomic status. Uh, the times where that becomes a problem is when you have a stack of number a, ones a stack of this the, big and a stack number that, threes this the, the big. threes are are the highest and, and and that becomes because parents know how to navigate the system but you know nationally best practice is you however you um, you know have your categories that it would be a third a third and a third within a school to ensure that highest need are there um, you know kind of middle of the road need is there and then maybe those that um, are the lowest need student population would be there. But the lottery then picks essentially just like we would say a ping pong ball comes up and that student is, is in, that, in that school. 
Um, another question was about uh, under the proposal, there would be these diversity targets for every magnet program, I think believe mm -hmm. down to the individual program. So in manual, the five different programs would each have to adhere to this or strive for this, I think is the language that the original proposal used of having, um, oh gosh, let's see if I can remember, 30% category one, 50% category two, and 20 category three. Um, but I think we've seen already with the diversity range uh, that there are some programs kind of like towing the line and getting away with that, that the MST example, you know, the 33 black mm -hmm. children in that program. And I know the categories are not b based solely on race, but will you be recalibrating the metrics that you're using? Because if they're already not being effective, if you just flip them and use them in another way, is that even worth the time and energy? Well, I think the goal here is we have to look at the, it, we could get into the specifics. And, and so since we've put that out, obviously we've had a lot of change. The new mm -hmm. census numbers were, are due, you know, so that we can have that. That changes a lot. The old numbers were based on 2010 data. So it's a decade later. A lot of things have changed in our community over a decade. Um, and so really I, I, I want to get to what the, the, we want our programs and our schools to reflect our student population. And I think, you know, when we look at that, that, that is a very sensible and, and understandable way to look at it. Now it's hard to get it. When you start talking ones, twos, and threes, it gets confusing. But we want our schools and our programs to reflect our student population. And I'll say this, that, you know, we have not substantially changed student assignment in JCPS in 40 years. When we change this, I think there is a feeling that says, well, I guess 40 years from now, we can come back and look at it again. I hope this works out. Review of student assignments should be an ongoing process. I mean, it should be an every other year process, report to the board. It should be every five years, do a deep dive into it and make necessary changes. Are those numbers happening? Are they not happening? Why, if they're not happening, we have to make changes to it. So I think when we talk about student assignment, it seems always like, you know, this is for the next half century. You know, this should be for the next five years that we're talking about and even be able to move in midstream if we see something happening after two or three years to be able to make changes to that. So I, I think that's important because, you know, when in 1984 when this system was designed, there was only a handful of Title I schools, Title I being the highest poverty schools for JCPS that's above 70 percent. Um, free and reduced lunch. There was only a handful. So most of the kids that we were sending to out into the community from West Louisville were going to non-Title I schools. Now our only high schools in Jefferson County that are not Title I are Ballard, Eastern, and Atherton. Every other reside school is Title I. So many of our children are being sent out to the schools outside of their community that are high poverty schools. But that's what happens when you don't change it for 40 years. The population changes. And I think it says a lot to our community that childhood poverty is to the point now where it's closing in on 70% of the children in Jefferson County are identified as living in poverty. I think we really have to take that part of it too and say, you know, how do we change that in Louisville, Kentucky and in the United States that childhood poverty is skyrocketing like that? That's really alarming and concerning in a much bigger way than just student assignment. Um, one thing that the district does have some control over, a uh, uh, listener submitted a question about, you know, with the way that the, some of these magnets are really middle class enclaves, we see not just, you know, the funding that you're allocating to the school budgets, but we see this outside money through PTAs mm -hmm. and boosters and, the example in the story was manual uh, in a single year had more than half a million raised to go through go to all sorts of things from field trips, classroom supplies, um, test prep sessions, whereas Iroquois had none. Where does this fit into your proposal or does it at all? So I think it's an important point and there's several layers of funding that we have to look at. First of all, there is 
district-based funding, the, the funding that the district provides to the school that, you know, that we get and say, the Academy at Shawnee is budgeted X amount of dollars for the 21-22 school year, and how much is per person, per pupil funding. If we broke that down right now, the Academy at Shawnee is probably close to double the amount of per pupil funding that DuPont Manual is. So we are accomplishing that in, a, in resourcing per pupil our highest poverty schools. Now I think we need to be much, have much more clarity around that and bring in what we need to bring in English language learners, we need to bring in special education. Those things haven't been a part of our funding process at all ever. And so it's really important that we bring these in so that we can and ensure that the schools are targeting those students. The second layer of funding though is what you're referring to is really that external support and funding for the school. And there is little doubt that a DuPont Manual, a Ballard High School, an Eastern High School towers in comparison to the Academy at Shawnee. It would only take a look at their athletic fields and uh, versus each other. And this, this is an issue all across America, from booster clubs to PTAs, those you know, families and parents that are going to be um, you know, donating money and those type of things to the school or volunteering at the school. So, you know, we are really looking at ways that we can mitigate that. And even if that means we supplement the school with additional um, activity funds, that's what they are. It's not locked in a code, so to speak, that they could spend those for football uniforms, cheerleading uniforms, chess club, all of those things that make a school powerful that we are doing that with our you know, funding of high poverty schools. Our goal, and this is getting into a whole nother thing, is to, Rapid fund, fire. Is to fund with our tax increase that we have asked for. Um, and I think that's where we're gonna see funding for our high poverty schools. Okay. Sorry, it wasn't that rapid. That's okay. Um, a quick question on one of the, the many pieces of the state accountability system um, and how it is impacting the, the, the schools that are often called the bad schools. Um, the school-based decision-making councils and having that power essentially removed uh, while they're in this like priority status. The question is, I, I, basically, where do you stand on, mm -hmm. should that remain part of the accountability system or short, should the schools like a Shawnee, for example, be empowered to have that just as a Ballard or an Eastern? Well, I think what we've seen is some of the steps that were taken about 10 years ago in this process that is still a part of federal guidelines that most states follow have not been successful in removing schools from uh, low performing priority CSI, whatever, you know, the, it's over the decade been uh, a bunch of different names. Uh, so I don't think that has been successful. I think it was more to be a business model to say, let's get a principal in there that's not hindered by SBDM. And I really think when you talk about education, um, th that model is not what's successful. You know, it is bringing people along with you, parents, families, teachers, students, the neighborhood, businesses. Um, and so, you know, I, there are things that I think, uh, well, first of all, I'll say this. I, yes, I believe the SBDMs should be reinstated at all schools. Um, there are some things that I, I have concerns about SBDM having control over as opposed to the district, um, but I do think SBDMs would be healthy at, at every single school. Such as like curriculum or? Curriculum. Okay. Um, uh, another question. Uh, somebody was wondering if in, you know, you said this was not a Marty Polio magnet proposal, but in all of this, has the district looked elsewhere at specific examples in the country that are using practices that you think are delivering more equitable access and opportunity? Yeah, we've had um, significant conversations with those districts who have been successful with their magnet programs, who have gotten the magnet school grants that we have not received. Um, now, I'll say this, they said the same thing. It was a process that they are about five or six years ahead of us in that process. But, um, you know, we, um, um, gosh, I lost my train of thought there. Um, but yes, we have spoken to many of our uh, school partners that are in the Council of the Great City Schools. So, you know, we don't have nearly 
the partners in the state of Kentucky that we can talk about a significant you know, series of magnet schools in a district, but we've talked to Wake County. Um, we have talked to Miami Public Schools. There are many schools that um, we've talked to and, and had you know, in-depth conversations about best practice. Yeah, I think Miami has actually had um, a lot of success in diversifying. And, they have. Um, Houston was another one that we know. really talked about as far as their magnet programs. Um, another question. Where did it go? I just lost it. Um, so when we get back to thinking about this, we look at the spread of students from special education to race to income at some of these elite magnet schools. You've talked about wanting to make the admissions process more transparent and maybe thinking about are the criteria the right criteria to be using. Um, but what about everything that's leading to that point? One example that we brought up in the series was access to advanced math courses mm -hmm. uh, in middle school. And a lot of that is tied up again into a very um, historical program in this district, the advanced program. Um, which begins essentially sorting students in the fourth grade. Where do sort of these structural issues that are, you know, parents are just following along this system that mm -hmm. um, is in front of them. Do you plan on looking at those sort of things and not just right when it gets to applying for the magnet? Yes, yeah, so I think that's a, a fantastic point and a fantastic question that goes very deep and early into the childhood experience in JCPS. So, you know, when we take the COGAT test, and so first of all, for decades, JCPS has been an error in only using the COGAT test to determine gifted and talented. But when a student meets that score, they are now on a different tra trajectory than other students um, and are essentially, essentially considered gifted. And they go into a track in middle school where they can have Algebra one in the eighth grade. If a student does not have Algebra one in the eighth grade, it becomes very difficult for them to then be on an AP track, an IB track, whatever that may be. I'll give an example. As a principal at J-Town High School, we have Project Lead the Way Engineering. You know, we felt it was not diverse enough, you know, but once a student entered our school, if they had not had Algebra one yet, it became very challenging for them to make it through the program. So our choice became double up in math as a freshman or a sophomore. That's very challenging and hard for many kids uh, to have two maths and that, you know, they're taking Algebra one and geometry at the same time. And so we really have to ensure in the front end that we do everything we can to expand you know, that gifted and talented pool for every student that's gifted and talented clearly reflects our student population. And along the way, we give on ramps to other kids, fifth grade, sixth grade, seventh grade, to get onto this advanced track um, throughout their schooling process. So I don't think that has been done. I know that hasn't been done effectively. I think we've made major changes over the past couple of years to expand that. But I think some of those you might not see for many years before a kid gets to the high school level. And a lot of times when we talk about programs like that, um, parents have concerns um, that expanding opportunities for others will result in opportunities being taken away from my child. Like it's a zero sum mm -hmm. game. Is it? I don't think it is. And that, you know, one of my other passions is grading. And I believe that, you know, <laughs> that, I mean, we can't get into that here. Passion of grading. Yes, Tell I know, more. I know that's a really nerdy thing to say. Um, but if a student takes more time, you know, if we are both taking a test in a math class and you pass it the first time, but it takes me multiple opportunities to pass that, but we both end up with an A, is that fair to you? I, I believe in the end, you know, we both have mastered the standards. I believe if two lawyers pass the bar and it takes one, two or three attempts to pass it, they're still considered a lawyer. So I don't think it's a zero sum game. I think when we are offering opportunities for all kids, you know, and obviously improving all of our schools, kids are gonna be successful. My daughter was gonna be successful whether it was Manuel or Atherton. Um, and so, you know, I was just as pleased for her to attend Atherton. We're close to wrapping up here. So what's next? What is the timeline that you foresee? Um, when can people 
see a written proposal? When will there be board meetings they can attend? What's next? Yeah, so we got some major issues on our plate, um, everything from COVID to safety and security in school to student assignment, um, you know, and, and um, many of the national issues that face school districts all across America right now. Um, and we're tackling each one as they come. But student assignment, you know, our plan is that sometime in the spring, we will be bringing a full recommendation to our, our board for vote and approval. Um, and so over the next several months, one of the problems we had in COVID is not being able to have real you know, public feedback. So Zoom meetings, those type of things become difficult for the public to truly give us feedback. So our plans are to get out in the community, listen to the community. We wanna hear the Board of Education, obviously, and their thoughts. What I want everyone to agree to, Mandy, uh, and this is when I look at the camera, what I want everyone to agree to is that what we are doing now is not working. It may have worked 40 years ago, I don't know. It's not my responsibility to anything that happened 40 years ago. What I do know is what is happening now with our student assignment plan is ineffective in supporting student achievement. Um, and but what make, if, what's that? Up, but what if it's working for my kid? What well, is your pitch to those parents? You know, my job as a superintendent is to ensure that all kids are successful. You know, and I'm committed to that. We've, and if we are going to be successful as a community, we can't leave kids behind. So this is a community-wide issue. You know, we have to make sure that all of our kids are successful. Uh, but if we all agree that what we're doing now is not working, okay, that's fine. Now we're going to have a proposal and get feedback on it and make changes if necessary before a vote. Um, but we have to all agree what we're doing now. And I think there's widespread agreement what we're doing now is not working. We need to make change. We will be voting on it before the end of the year. And if folks wanted to see in writing some of these magnet proposals, would it be too far off for them to look at what you put out in October 2020? Or is it? You I think the magnet proposals will be very similar to what we put out in 2020. The numbers may be a little different. We may adjust based on um, new census data, but I think the proposals will be very similar for magnets. And he's saying four magnets because, of course, a whole thing that we didn't get into here in much depth is uh, all the other changes that I know you'll be bringing forward related to busing and dual resides. Um, but that's going to kind of bring us to our end here. So thank you so much Great. for giving us your time. Uh, Courier Journal appreciates it. And I want to thank you at home or wherever you are listening to this for joining the conversation, watching, submitting comments, and being engaged in, like Dr. Polio said, um, the future of this community. Again, if you want to read the stories that we've been referencing this whole time, all you have to do is go to couriergournal.com slash magnetic pull, or you can go to your favorite podcast app and look up a bad school. Uh, we have four episodes out right now, and you have time to catch up before we publish the final two. I'm Mandy McLaren. Thank you so much for being here, and we'll see you next time.